Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the third in Abate University's cybersecurity webinar series entitled Keeping Children Safe Online. My name is Dr. Ian Ferguson. I'm a senior lecturer in the cybersecurity division in the School of Design and Informatics, and I'm hosting the webinar today. For those of you who aren't familiar with Abate, we're a, a small university based in Dundee in Scotland. And for the past 14 years, we've been teaching ethical hacking and cybersecurity to both undergraduate and postgrad students. And I know that there are both ex and current students here today. Good to see you all, current students, what you're doing here, you should be doing your assignment. Uh, and of course, a warm welcome to those of you for whom this is your first involvement with Abate, and especially to those of you who are participating as part of the Cyber Scotland Week, a particular welcome to you. One of the, the joys of working at Abate, and there are many, is that we maintain strong links with uh, the wider cybersecurity community, and I'm delighted the two eminent members of that community have volunteered their time to discuss and debate for us today. So I'd like to welcome our panel, John Carr, OBE, and Professor Karen Reno. Uh, and in a second, I shall hand over to them to introduce themselves. Uh, I should say we have inevitably had some Teams gremlins, uh, and as you'll see, John's video isn't live, but uh, I assure you it is the real John Carr there. So John, if I could possibly invite you to, to say a few words to just tell people who you are, and then we'll come to you, Karen. <coughs> um. Good morning, and I'm very sorry my camera isn't isn't working uh, this morning, but believe you me, the picture you can see of me is a lot better than the real thing. Um, <clears throat> so I was a member of Microsoft's policy board for Europe, the Middle East and Africa for six years. I was a vice president of MySpace, um, technically ba uh, based in Los Angeles for four years. I worked for for Google and Vodafone and great many uh, high tech companies. Um, and I am currently a, a senior fellow at the London School of Economics and Political Science. I've been involved in one way or another with um, online child protection issues since around 1995, uh, 1996. <clears throat> and for 17 uh, consecutive years, I was a member of the UK wide. Uh, Council for Child Internet Safety. It's now called the Council for Internet Safety. They've taken the word child out of the title. Uh, all four nations were represented on it, um, uh, by the way. And I'm currently a, a consultant to the Council of Europe um, and I'm an advisor to the United Nations. So uh, a lot of my work is international in nature, but it's deeply rooted in, in the experience of British children. I work for and I'm an advisor to the NSPCC, Bernardo's, the Children's Society, and all of the major children's groups that you are likely to have heard of, and some of the ones that you probably haven't heard of. I hope that's enough to give you an idea of my background. That's great, John. Thank you very much. So, uh, okay, I'm going to transfer over to Karen here and say, uh, Karen, can you tell us who you are, please? Yes, uh, thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Karen Reno. I'm from the University of Strathclyde, but I also hold visiting professor positions at Aberte University and also Rhodes University in South Africa. So my research area is human centered security, but my particular interest over the last few years has been to understand the online harm area when it comes to children and to provide resources for parents, carers and teachers to help them mitigate these online harms. So my pedigree is not nearly as impressive as John's, but I'm equally passionate about the topic. Thank you, Ian. No problem. Thank you, both of you. Um, OK, so the, the purpose of today's webinar is basically to discuss the problem, and hopefully some solutions uh, of keeping children safe online. The, the, the current situation with COVID, as I'm sure you know, has exacerbated an already significant problem. Uh, as children and adults too, of course, have been spending massively more time online as they try to keep up with their education uh, and also with their, you know, their social circle through video games, chat, etc, etc. So what we're going to do is I'm going to try and structure the discussion today ar around a series of four questions. So firstly, what I want to do is look at uh, what the dangers are and actually how real that threat is. We hear a lot of hype about it. Is it real? 
Secondly, we'll take a look at who can help in the task of protection. Who are the who are the, the key stakeholders in this? Who has a role to play in doing that? Perhaps with some remarks on kind of practical steps that can be, be taken. We'll then try and broaden things out a bit uh, and explore what can be done by design uh, is the phrase that we came up with to ensure that online safety um, is a thing. And by this, I simply mean that are the service providers, are the software providers, are the big players, the regulators, government, law enforcement, etc. Um, what do they have to do to ensure a safe experience for children? May include parents, may include the children themselves, may include carers, teachers, etc., etc. All the usual things. Finally, we'll kind of try our hand at crystal ball gazing and see if we can foresee some of the issues and possible solutions that might be on the horizon, both UK uh, and globally. So that's uh, the way it'll go. I'll invite the speakers to spend about half an hour in total on these discussion points. I'll try and keep it moving. And we're going to leave about 10, 15 minutes at the end for questions and answers. And I'd like to encourage you, the audience, please, um, you know, uh, Please do post questions for us, uh, our speakers. I'll try and moderate them uh, in the Q&A box on the, the right hand side there. If we run out of time at the end and we're not able to answer all of the questions, we'll do our best to kind of address these in, a, in an offline after the event thing uh, and answers will be disseminated you know, as part of our post event communications. So let's turn to our, our speakers, please. And uh, John, I think we're going to invite you to, to, to respond first to this one. So the first question that I'd like to pose to the panel what are some of the dangers that children face from interacting online? And have any new ones come to light or become more prevalent during the pandem pandemic? John, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, well, first of all, on, on the on the points about the pandemic, <clears throat> um, I don't think any new uh, dangers or risks, hazards have emerged uh, during the pandemic, but it certainly has put some of the older established ones, the ones that we've known about for some time, on steroids, and it's magnified them and exacerbated them. But I don't think you could say that we've detected anything which is wholly new. Having said that, there, are, there is anxiety about the question of the amount of time children have been spending in front of screens. All I can say on that is that the jury is still out. So we all know children have been spending more time than they ordinarily would on screens during the pandemic, but whether or to what extent that is harmful, bad or whatever, it, there is no concrete evidence one way or another. Uh, I think the, the better view is what matters more uh, is what children are doing when they're in front of a screen rather than necessarily uh, the amount of time that, that they're spending on it. Obviously within limits, because children need other things to do other things and get fresh air and exercise and all of that kind of stuff. But uh, that's all I can say on the point about uh, uh, the amount of time. The, the historic uh, risks to children, uh, which as I say have been amplified during uh, uh, lockdown, are under three headings and they all conveniently begin with the letter C. Uh, content, contact and commerce. So there are uh, types of material, types of pictures, images, and so on online, which are absolutely definitely age inappropriate. Uh, and you can't speak about children as if they were all the same. Obviously a five-year-old is not the same as a 17-year-old, even though legally 18 is the, is, the, is the cutoff point. Nevertheless, at whatever age range you take, there are definitely uh, sites, pictures, images, content uh, that children of any age shouldn't be being exposed to. Um, so that's the content heading. Contact heading, uh, there are two types uh, uh, of issues which arise under that heading. Uh, one is uh, contact by uh, bullies, uh, by sexual predators, um, or by interests that wish to radicalise uh, children and, and draw them towards extremist po politics terrorist organizations, that kind of thing. And the third, the third heading, commerce, you know, that again divides into, if you like, two headings. Uh, one is straightforward uh, children buying stuff, uh, under, having been lured into it under false pretenses or without fully comprehending the nature of the products or service they're buying, whether it's paying with their own 
debit card or the parents' credit card. Uh, and the second thing, and, and closely allied to that, of course, is exposure to advertising, which uh, is deliberately intended to trick children. And linked to that, of course, are issues of privacy, uh, because all of these companies that are advertising and selling online are also collecting children's data. And there are a range of issues linked to the misuse of children's data, which are also a cause for concern. I think that sums up the broad nature of the, the risks to children. So again, nothing new that I'm aware of under lockdown, but certainly things have been magnified under each of those headings. The police, and this will be my last word um, in this section, the police have certainly recorded a huge increase in certain types of crimes against children during, during lockdown. I mean, in the magnitude of 30% over normal times. And um, actually, I should have said the, 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 the other thing, which perhaps you would say is new, is lockdown has underlined the huge problems that children have if they don't have connectivity, if they're not able and they don't have the right devices to be able to keep up with school work um, whilst they're not in school. OK, thanks. For that. It's a very interesting and kind of valuable way of dividing the space up there. So you, uh, thanks for that. Karen, do you want to give your perspective? Do you uh, want to say uh, something different to John? Do you want to look at it a different way? Tell us, tell us what you're thinking. I totally agree with John, but I, I did have my own kind of take on it. So I think that we have issues on the cyber security and the cyber safety side. And the cyber safety side is a lot of what John was talking about. But when uh, my interest has often been in the cybersecurity side, and this is related to the child's information and devices. Um, whereas I see cyber safety, the four, three C's as being related to the well-being of the child. So in terms of cyber, children don't learn the right principles early on. So they're going online without the requisite skills. So for example, the given passwords before they can read and write. This encourages them to use insecure coping skills like copying them from written records or using very predictable passwords like their names. Um, and this then establishes unhelpful habits that will easily persist into adulthood. Um, the, the ones that John was talking about, children are playing in a virtual world, venturing into areas they might not yet have the skills to cope with. And as John said, they may see things they're not mature enough to, to, to see or be contacted by a groomer. So the challenge is twofold. We have to keep them safe when they're young, but we also have to educate them for a safe and secure online future. So during the pandemic, many children have been forced to go online to do schoolwork, but their parents might not know how to secure the devices or be unaware of the range of safety related online harms. The teachers are also struggling to help the children access the GLOW network in Scotland from home when the kids often forget their passwords, which has led to writing down and sharing passwords in families. While this is understandable during the pandemic, it sends the wrong messages to the children and might normalize these kinds of password behaviors. This morning, I read a story about an eight-year-old child who didn't want to attend online Zoom sessions. So she figured out that she could lock herself out by entering a wrong password three times. It would be much harder for her to play hooky uh, if she was in a normal school, but I think she has a great future as an ethical hacker. Thank you. We'll get her signed up. <laughs> Splendid. A um, couple of questions kind of occur to me before we move too far on with this one, folks. From what you're saying, Karen, and again, I'm interested to know what John's thoughts are on this. You know, do children have a part to play in their own security? It seem, seems an awfully hard thing to kind of put any of the onus on them, but do they do they have to learn certain basics before they can go online? What are, what are your thoughts, Karen? Well, I, I, they do, yes. It's the same as you as an adult, as a, as a parent. The first thing you teach a child is hold my hand, don't cross the road unless you're with mommy. But as they get older, you, you teach them look left, look right, look left again. And so it's a basic, you know, a, a, a parenting process or, a, a you know, a, an adult teaching that child how to behave in the physical world to stay safe. We cannot just dump the, let these kids into the online world without actually upskilling them in the same way. And I think that parents and teachers and carers are doing their level best in this area, but the pandemic has just catapulted people in right now, and they may not yet quite know how to do that. 
Is is there anything, Karen? Forgive my ignorance on this one. I mean, I, I can remember, you know, as a as a kid years ago, we had uh, the Green Cross Code and Stop, Look and Listen and the Tufty Club. For those of a certain age, I'm probably the only one who remembers that kind of thing. You know, teaching road safety and don't accept lift from strangers and all this kind of thing. Is there anything like that for parents just to suggest how they can inculcate that, you know, hold 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 mum's hand? There are, a lot of, there are a lot of people developing these kinds of things, Ian. Um, but, you know, a lot of people will go to Google and get mm -hmm. completely overwhelmed and not know what to follow. And part of the work that I've been doing with colleagues at Abrite is really to bring a lot of stuff together so that we can offer resources that are easy to, to access, easy to process, and just hits the spot uh, for the teachers across Scotland. We'll get to the parents next, but currently we're working to resource teachers. OK, cool. Thank you. John, did you want to say anything on this particular point? The fundamental, um, the fundamental problem with this whole area, of course, is the Internet was designed for and by highly educated yes. adults. Yeah. Right? Children, when, if you'd have told Vince Cerf and Robert Kahn and some of the people who built the basic building blocks of the internet, which we are still relying on, that a, a child would be able to access the internet um, ha while hiding under a duvet um, in their bedroom at night. They would have they would have asked if you were quite well. Um, it, they would never have, they could never have imagined and did never imagine that the world would turn out of the internet and all of the digital devices that can now connect to it would turn out the way they did. And they've all said if they had known that this is how it would pan out, they would have done things very differently and they would have built in security protocols and various other things that would have made it harder, probably not impossible, but harder for a lot of the bad stuff that I was talking about before uh, to happen. So, yes, of course, we should. Uh, help children to understand how to stay safe and there's some brilliant resources out there. I'm on the board of a, an organization called Internet Matters, Internet Matters, which is wholly funded by the industry and they produce some really, really great stuff, easy to remember the stuff. The police, believe it or not, uh, the, and they work again on a four country basis. Uh, they've got some great resources on theirs, which kids and parents can find uh, useful. But at the end of the day, what is what is completely unacceptable and, and is you know, will not last much longer is the is the ability of uh, internet companies to put stuff out there without considering the impact of what their products or services will have on children because because they've never had any legal liability uh, um, because of the, the peculiar way in which the internet emerged. Okay, thanks. For, thanks for that. Um, there's a, a name from the past for any of the students listening. Vint Surf, if you don't know who he is, go uh, go Google him. It's uh, educational. Um, I think John's point there actually about the uh, some of the the onus being on the the ISPs and the companies to to help provide security. For this actually moves us quite nicely onto our, our next area here, kind of the positive side and who are the actors in the in the solution space. So. Let's move on to the next question, please. Um, and that is basically who can be helping protect children online in a kind of day to day immediate sense and what can they be doing? Uh, and Karen, I think I'm going to come to you first uh, on this one. Are you? OK. Well, parents are trying to do at the moment during the pandemic, parents are trying to do their own jobs as well as homeschooling. And it's just often impossible for them to monitor their children's online activities all the time, unless they're in the lucky position of, of only maybe having one child or not having to work, maybe they're furloughed. But there are some technical tools they can use. And so we need to make sure that the adults who care for children know about these. So which can really make things a lot easier. They're not perfect, but they're a lot better than not doing anything at all. So we need to empower parents, carers and teachers. They have, as I said before, a wealth of experience in keeping children safe in the physical world. So we have to upskill them and provide them with the resources so that they can exercise those same skills, their wisdom that comes with age in the virtual world. There's a measure of urgency because as the pandemic, the pandemic has increased the number of children going online. And as John mentioned, the amount of time they spend online. 
But it's not merely a matter, I feel, of bombarding parents with information. Um, it's not merely a, a, a knowledge deficit issue, in my view. There's a widespread lack of confidence amongst the general public when it comes to cyber matters. And we need to support these folks to build that capacity and to give them more confidence as they gain more uh, cap capacity and capability. I guess what I'm saying is there's no quick fix here. We need a range of interventions and we should acknowledge that this will take the time to correct. We have to be prepared for the long haul. Okay. Over to John now, I think. Thank Excellent. you. Just quickly before you start, John, just to say to our audience, I'm seeing some of the questions coming, pinging in here, and these are good questions. I will make sure we get time to, to cover those towards the end. But um, yes, uh, certainly some things I'd like to, to cover there. John, do you want to say anything about uh, on that particular question of, uh, of of who can be doing the who who should be doing the protecting at this point? As parents, uh, well, and in my case, a grandparent, I know you wouldn't think it looking at my picture, but it's <laughs> true. Um, obviously, we we have the ultimate responsibility for our children and grandchildren. Nobody else does. Uh, so it's not something that we can just sort of sit back and say, well, somebody else should be doing this, because uh, if you don't do it, you can't, you know, you can't be certain it will be done at all. And that goes back to Karen's point about the confidence, parents' confidence. And you know, there's this there's this great myth, and it is a myth, that all kids are super cool dudes. They understand the internet and digital technology, and it's only stupid old adults who don't. And it's simply not true. It's a very um, a very convenient um, uh, mistake or misapprehension. But there's as much a broader range of knowledge and understanding of digital technologies of the internet amongst kids as there is amongst adults. Um, and so you shouldn't feel embarrassed or, or find a way of dealing with your embarrassment by sitting down and talking to kids. And there are lots of resources out there. Parent Zone is another great place, gives you tips for icebreakers, you know, ways of getting into conversations with your kids. Uh, Internet Matters, the one I'm on the board, mem the board member of, they've got similar sorts of things. Talking to your kids is a really important way, but never ever threaten to take the Internet away from them if they misbehave. Because all that that will do uh, is ensure that they never tell you or come to you if something does go wrong or something troubling does happen, because they'll be worried that you'll cut them off. And in every 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 case I've ever seen, it's never worked. I think that's incredibly valuable advice, actually, John. I mean, I, th I think you know what you're saying. It's not only about the the myth that the kids understand it better. I don't like using the word kids, children, whatever. Hey. Um, it's the fact that they think they understand and they don't, uh, and that, that can be an issue in itself. But certainly the, the, the threat to take the internet away uh, will just make them hide stuff. And that's a, an incredibly valuable thing. OK, can we can we turn perhaps now to looking at, you know, having said that it is maybe a parent or carer or a teacher's responsibility to to, to be to be looking after the, the child. Um, can we look perhaps at what the larger organisations can be doing about this? So. Um, I've kind of headed this section security and safety by design. And we kind of know that the internet has evolved to where it is rather than being designed this way. But what can people like the, the ISPs, the, the people who write apps, the mobile phone companies, um, the regulators, law enforcement, government, what, what can people like that, what should they be doing um, to try and move the internet in the direction of being a safer place for everyone and children in particular to be. So uh, to kind of sum that up in one short question, how can design help or obstruct online security and safety of children? Uh, and John, I think I'm going to come straight back to you for this one, please. The, the problem, as I mentioned earlier, is that under UK law, again, this is all four nations, uh, under UK law, the, the platforms have no legal liability for the actions of the third parties utilising their platforms. And that provided a perverse incentive for the platforms to do nothing. And a great many platforms do nothing to help uh, keep their environments safe. 
but a great many do. I mean, the big platforms, Facebook, Google, uh, Microsoft, you know, all of the big consumer brands, they do take uh, certain steps to try to keep off bad content from bad people and bad actors, and they accept their responsibility. But even then, because there is no legal obligation on them to do these things, we don't know for sure, because there's no transparency attaching to any of this either, we don't know for sure if they're doing as much as they should or as much as they could. Transpar the transparency regime has to change, the legal obligations have to change, and the good news is it's going to change. Um, there is a, a bill uh, which will shortly appear in the, uh, in the British Parliament in London, but it, uh, it will be UK-wide again, called the Online Harms White Paper, and I might add the Scottish National Party has been extremely uh, hot on these issues in a very helpful and progressive way. But by the way, so have all of the parties, because everybody knows that the current setup is not acceptable. And safety by design is going to be a key part of the legal framework which tech companies have to observe. Just a, a quick word, if I may, since about 2005, as a matter of fact, if you bought a new mobile phone, or rather if you got a new SIM card in the United Kingdom, uh, the mobile network that you joined assumed you were a child and you would not have been able to gain access to porn sites, gambling sites, alcohol sites, tobacco sites through your mobile phone network without first going through an age verification uh, system. 90% of all of the domestic broadband supplied within the United Kingdom comes with built-in free safety tools. And in many instances, if you're a Sky, if you get Sky broadband, for example, those safety tools will be turned on by default. The problem is, uh, and that is a safety by design measure that's already there. Uh, the problem probably, with, certainly with the latter, is that a great many people aren't aware of them. And, and it could be possibly that the, the settings have been tweaked without their permission or authority because they weren't aware of them. But anyway, there you go. Those are the, the fundamental thing is we need to change the, the basis of legal liability in this whole space. Excellent, John. Thank you. Now that's an in, interesting point, an interesting insight. Karen, come on, this one's right up your street. <laughs> co co what should corporate America be doing about the internet? Well, I, I totally agree with everything that John said, uh, that the products, um, that John is talking a lot about ISPs and uh, companies, but I think a lot of the products we use are not properly designed or secured. So last week there was a story about a nursery cam, which parents could use to keep an eye on their children while at nursery school. It had a huge vulnerability which leaked the parents' usernames and passwords. So they don't really know if the hackers exploited the vulnerability to watch the children. So they are building codes for fires, earthquakes, tornadoes. We need some industry codes for secure products uh, or, or for the security of products. The Information Commissioner can impose fines if people's um, data is leaked, but it only happens if the breaches become known. And it's quite common for hackers to breach systems and then hide out to carry their nefarious activities undetected and unsuspected. So if you think about this huge solar winds attack that took place in the US, they were under under detected and undetected for almost a year. And and solar winds is a security company. So this is probably happening a lot more than we realize. So I think there's a great need for secure software engineering techniques to be taught at all universities across the board. Aberte is at the forefront in teaching these and equipping their graduates to ensure that security is designed into products and not bolted on at the end. We need to do more of this across the board. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Karen. No, I think that's... Um, can I, that's can I just... Uh, yeah, sure, John. Can I just add, add, add a point here? Um, because Karen just reminded me of an extremely important... Uh, another dimension to the same story that she was just telling. Um, there's a lot of toys that are now being manufactured, which come with internet connectivity. Either uh, they've got Wi-Fi, a Wi-Fi component built, built in, so that allows the toy to connect to the internet through the family router, or some of them require a, <clears throat> a cable connection to a USB port on, on, on a computer. There, there, were, there have been two cases in particular which I got involved in. Uh, one was of a little computer looking thing that was meant for four and five year olds that enabled the kid to talk to different apps on the computer. 
all of the conversations that that child had with the device were being transmitted unencrypted across the internet and were being hacked and stored and taken away. We don't know, we still don't know who did it. We still don't know uh, where those conversations ended up, um, but they were hacked um, and it put the children and the households with those devices in them at, at, at risk. And they may have been harmed on, we don't really know, but it was an example of how even with something as basic as a toy aimed at a child, industry and the people who manufactured it and sold it didn't somehow connect the dots and work out that it was important to have security um, built in. Dolls, dolls that you can talk to and have conversations with. I mean, there are ethical and other questions about whether you want your child to develop a relationship with a, a speaking doll, but that's another point. But even with these speaking dolls, similar sorts of issues arose where the data that the, the toy was collecting from the child was being transmitted unencrypted uh, across the uh, open net in, um, and was open to hackers from anywhere in the world. So even with the toy industry, we should take nothing for granted. OK, thanks, John. You, you, you actually just stole my line completely there. It's absolutely fine, but um, I, was, I was about to say something. We did a, a bit of work at Abate um, looking at uh, internet enabled baby cameras uh, and were really quite appalled by how little security there was in there. And you know, if, if folks are after a day to day thing to check, you know, if you are using these kind of devices, uh, for goodness sake, please make sure you have changed the default password on the device. It's a very simple thing to do and it will give you some modicum of, of protection. Um, but certainly we went through the whole process of having found that some of these cameras were vulnerable. We went back to the people who were selling them. And of course, it's somewhere in, you know, out there on eBay in China, wherever. Uh, and they really weren't very interested. And of course, there are no restrictions on selling these things. They're coming into the country they're dirt cheap. You can pick them up for a tenner. Um, yeah. Okay. Right. I'm rambling. Let's uh, let's let's move on a bit. Um, we're going to attempt the impossible. We're going to try and predict the the future and, and basically look at you know what do we think the direction of travel is for internet safety and security. Um, I think it's interesting that you know John's talked about legislation there and clearly there's there's some idea that we need to put some imperative upon the the big players in the internet market, whatever that phrase may mean. But I'm going to come back to uh, our panel again and ask them, what does the future of online security look like for children in the UK uh, and perhaps globally? Where do, you, where do you think we're going? What are the big things that might need to happen? And, oops, sorry, yeah, Karen, do you want to kick off with that one? <laughs> yes, yeah, so, so I think we're going to move towards uh, cyber security and cyber safety being integrated into our educational system, equally as important as the three R's. This might be a bit old fashioned of me, but when I went to school, reading and writing and arithmetic used to be the skills that schools taught. Now I think cyber citizenship has to be added to that and will be added to that. Perhaps the fourth R is resilience. So then by the time they get to high school, they're going to have a lot of the requisite skills to be safe and secure online. They might still do ill-advised things online because of their immaturity, but they will have that knowledge. And over time, they will learn how to navigate the online world both safely and securely. I remember back in the 1990s, we started getting using email my, where I was working. And we used, to see, we used to see people engaging in flaming wars, with really being absolutely mean to each other by email. But you just don't see that anymore because society now has learned how email should be used and they know that email can be used to prosecute you so they're more careful but as a society we've moved on to more responsible usage of tools that we're more used to so i believe the same will happen with online services and tools our job as researchers and people who are interested in this area is to make sure that we integrate the right lessons into the curriculum so when children need them and when they can handle them. So we do an age appropriate education. That way school leavers will be resilient. They'll be cyber secure and cyber safe online citizens. Thank you. OK, thank you for that, Karen. John, what do you, what do you where's, where does the future lie for us in this game? Well, about, <clears throat> about three weeks ago in Geneva, the, the United Nations Committee on the Rights of the Child, which is the bit of the UN that has responsibility.
responsibility for overseeing the UN Convention, uh, which was adopted in 1986, I think it was, uh, 89. Um, it adopted a what's called a general comment, which is a rather dry bureaucratic way of saying they didn't quite rewrite the convention, but they have issued a specific piece of advice to uh, governments of the world on how to interpret the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child in the light of the digital era. Because bear, bear in mind, it was 89 when, when, when the convention was adopted. So for practical purposes, not technically, but for practical purposes, it's a pre-internet document. And there's all kinds of language in there which simply we wouldn't use today uh, because, because we now know the world has changed dramatically um, since the internet arrived. And one, one of the point I'm trying to make is that I think we're not very far off from, from it being uh, considered to be a fundamental human right of a child to have access to the internet because it's become such an integral part both of the educational system, how you learn, and also for your rights as a citizen um, and a participant in, in, in the modern world. So there is going to be a huge focus on, on, on these issues, not just arising from that decision of the UN uh, a few weeks ago. The, the final text is not yet viewable online, although they made an announcement about it, but the, the final text will be out in a couple of months time <clears throat> but it's all of a piece I mean and one of the things that's probably given this legs in a way that nobody could have anticipated of course was the events in Washington DC on the 6th of January because what we saw there was a very extreme uh, expression of some of the regulatory and policy failures of the internet um, and we are uh, seeing them in a much smaller way, in a on a much smaller scale, in some of the issues that we are discussing today in respect of children. The internet was never designed with children in mind. Digital technologies were never designed with children in mind. We now have a very much better understanding of the consequences of the, that strategic and massive oversight. And I think governments around the world are all round about the same time. We've got the online harms bill coming to the Parliament in London, the European Union has, has just published the draft of the Digital Services Act um, <clears throat> in the United States. There's a bill before the Senate right now, uh, which is addressing essentially these questions. The Australian government is moving on these issues. Wherever you look in the liberal democratic world, uh, there is a huge amount of effort being put into addressing some of the uh, issues that we've been uh, discussing this morning. Safety by design and the kinds of things Karen's been talking about are going to be an integral part of that. John, thank you for that. We've we, we all been uh, a proper academic debate when we've gone from child safety online to the, uh, the, the, the riots in front of the Capitol in, uh, in January. Excellent uh, discussion. Thank you both for that. Um, Let's move now to kind of the question and answer phase. We're, we're running a couple of minutes behind time, so I don't know we'll get time to go through all of these questions, folks. Uh, I can see from the questions that we have a, a pretty in, well-informed audience out here this morning. Uh, and also, I recognise a couple of the names. Scott from uh, Bell Street, I think I know who, he, who that must be. Um, Ian Elder, is it Ian Elder the Elder or is it Ian Elder the Younger is the question, who knows? Uh, let's have a look at these questions though. Um, perhaps uh, I, I might come back with a, there's one which is clear, clearly to you here, John. I don't know whether you can see them, but I'll, I'll read the question out. Um, John Carr mentioned internet matters funded by the industry. How do they stay unbiased towards some of the content put out by industry leaders? For example, how do I rely on internet matters saying that TikTok can be safe for children when TikTok is actually paying for internet matters. Shouldn't the organisations providing us with that information actually be detached from the organisations we're keeping children safe from? So a question about independence there, John. Do you want to comment on that one? Yeah, um, well, Internet Matters is an industry body. Um, it produces some, some resources of its own, um, as do many other people. Um, if you look at the, the publications that they, they produce, they're all research based, typically involving an academic from the university uh, in drafting them and so on. 
I mean, why, why, do, why do companies like TikTok and others do it? Partly because they're frightened if they don't, they'll get even more criticism than they're getting at the moment. Um, so for them, it's a kind of self-defense mechanism in part, uh, but also some of these companies do it because they think it's the right thing to do and it makes more sense since the messages are essentially the same in most of the, most of the online environments for them to pool their knowledge and resources. But there are lots and lots of sources of, uh, of information and, and advice that are available. Internet Matters is only, is only one of them. Okay, excellent, John. Karen, did you want to say anything about that question? If not, um, there's another one I'd like to move on to about um, how you talk to your children about some of these things. Did you want to come back on that one? No, I'm okay, thank you. Okay, uh, there's another one from Anonymous here in this case, and again, I'll read this one out. Uh, there are many dangerous social media challenges. Should we talk about particular challenges that come up or not talk about it? Bigger organisations like Parent Zone, etc., recommend not to bring it to the attention of the child. But how will I know if my child is even aware of it or not? So basically, should we should we be telling children don't go to this particular dangerous site, or will that make them just go, oh, I'd better explore and see what that is? Do you feel? That's one you want to comment on, Karen? Um, this, this is a difficult one. So the literature that I've looked at about um, how how best to be that um, that nurturing kind of mentor all say that you should be that trusted adult. And the one paper I read was about sexting and they just said that if the kid has engaged in that and they need to be able to talk to a parent about it without the parent going completely ballistic and taking the phone away, which John, John was saying, you know, that's really crazy. So, you know, just being able to talk that kid through that, whatever they've done something stupid or, you know, talk them through it, be the trusted adult right now. This has not been very really clever, but how can we recover from that? That's really important because if the parent overreacts or starts becoming, taking, you know, applying punitive uh, sanctions or whatever, the kid will never talk to them again. And then they don't have somebody to help them if they get into trouble again. But this is particularly important with bullying. A lot, there's a massive amount of bullying on the internet and the kid needs to know that somebody has their back because there have been children who've committed suicide because they just didn't have anyone to turn to. So the parent, I, I don't know about uh, saying, um, Ian, don't, don't go to this web, don't, don't go to this website, don't go to that website. I learned when I had my kids, if you said, don't eat this, don't eat that, don't eat that, don't do this, don't do that, they would find something you hadn't forbidden and do that and then say, but you didn't do, you didn't say about that, <laughs> right? That's what kids yeah. are like. So it's better to give them the right way rather than starting to talk about all the wrong things they could do. Okay, so engaging them with the dialogue, but not necessarily giving them a whole list of don't, 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 don't. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, that's my view. <laughs> that's that's no, entirely reasonable, Karen. Entirely reasonable. Um, how are we doing for time? Let's move on. Go Gordy has a question. Uh, it's fair enough to hi highlight social media platforms, but we also have to consider that our children and young people are spending a considerable amount of their time gaming. And this is another aspect of concern where dangers are also lurking. Either of you feel you want to say anything about um, prevalence of gaming and the risks associated with that at the moment? I guess the key point about most most of the modern games is that they have a chat function associated to them. Um, and a lot of that chat function uh, with games will be unmoderated. Some of it will be real time conversation. You know, you have a headset on and you can actually be talking to people, not just texting like, like we're doing uh, with your chat box. Um, so absolutely no question. <laughs> uh, if your children are engaging with online gaming, it is highly likely that they will be encountering some extremely unsavory uh, individuals on there. And the reason for that is they know kids are there, so that's why they go there. Uh, the point about being a paedophile is, for example, you go where children are. So if you know that there's a lot of children in a gaming environment, that's where you are. So it's very important to have these conversations with children. Every child is different. There's no hard and fast rules. Just going back to that other question. Um, there's a there's certain particular sites that I would certainly make sure my kids understood that they shouldn't go there. And I would try to make sure by checking their browser history and other things to check if they'd actually gone there or not. 
Um, but every child will be different. You just have to, as a parent, make your own judgment about what will work for them. Perfect. Thanks, Joe. Just the job. Karen, do you want to do anything on that one? No, I think they've covered it all. Thank you. OK, well, uh, I'm afraid I think time's caught up with us a bit. We're going to have to draw this uh, to a close. Thank you to our speakers. And let me thank them on uh, behalf of the audience for the, the insight they've given this morning. Thank you, too, to the audience. Uh, we always worry whether we're going to get some some decent questions for the for the panelists to ask. And I think it's quite uh, we, the quality of the questions and the et cetera this morning is really quite, um, quite excellent. Uh, apologies if we didn't manage to get through to your particular question. I hope that the debate has kind of encompassed most of the issues that you've raised there, but it was good to have that discussion. So thank you to our audience. Um, a quick thanks also to our production team here at Abate, without whom none of this would happen. To all of those in the background, thank you for making it uh, it run smoothly. Um, Thank you to you, the audience, for joining us and for all of those questions. Uh, please do remember to sign up for our next one. Uh, not quite sure of the date of that yet, but we'll make sure that you know about it. We'll be looking at diversity and talent in cybersecurity for the next one. Um, if you can spare us just a couple more minutes of your time today, it would be incredibly useful if you could fill out the feedback survey that's uh, been posted. I think Loretta will have posted that in the, uh, the question and answer box. Indeed, she has. There's a survey monkey thing there. Uh, if you fill that in for us, please, it'll help us steer future events and make sure we're doing relevant things for you and that we're, we're, we're covering the issues that you would like us to cover. Um, just in case you can't get enough of Abate on cybersecurity, I'm going to give a quick plug. Uh, Dr. Natalie Cool, head of the Division of Cybersecurity, will be participating in the Scotsman's State of the Cyber Nation Annual Debate 2021 online tomorrow at 1.30. Uh, simply Googling Scotsman and State of the Cyber Nation Annual Debate will get you to the appropriate link. Um, once again, Thanks to our panel, John, Karen, thank you for that. Uh, to our audience, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you and 